Good evening, everyone. This is Shane Gebauer with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. Thanks again for tuning in. Once again, we have Dr. Larry Connor with us from Wickwas Press. He's been doing this series on various topics, uh, all related to beekeeping, obviously. Tonight, we have the pleasure of bee biology. And I know that uh, whenever I teach classes, bee biology seems to be one of the, cor the, the topics that people sort of dread because they think back to their high school science class, but I always emphasize that it's, it's one of the more important parts. You've got to know a little bit about these creatures and understand them so that you can successfully manage them. So I'm looking forward uh, to the, the conversation this evening with Larry. Um, Larry, I'll turn it over to you uh, and let you, you take it. All righty. Well, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to be here again. I believe this is the last one for a while, uh, these webinars we're doing. Not saying the last one, period. I'm just saying the last one for a while. Um, I picked the biology for several reasons. <clears throat> Let's see if I can remember what they were. First of all, um, from a personal standpoint, I've been working with Dewey Karen about a revision of his textbook which is uh, honeybee biology and beekeeping. So it was sort of on my mind for that re regard. But when I put together tonight's talk, I, I decided, well, I really want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are involved in uh, what we uh, talk about bee biology. And no, I'm not going to bore you with all the details about how many days this takes and how many hours this takes. Or that takes because I really want to emphasize some of the key aspects. And, and when we talk about what's important in, in a beehive, and one of the things I learned back, oh, <laughs> 1976, Dr. Uh, Bud Kale, G. H. Kale Jr., who was the designer and uh, the brains behind the Starline and the Midnight Hybrid Beats, neither of which, of course, exist anymore. So if you're still buying them from your local bee supply dealer, you're either in a time warp or they're not really the same thing. So Bud Kale talked about selecting bees for their egg-laying rate. And there is a, you know, a tri triangular relationship between egg laying rate and brood and honey production. Well, that makes a certain amount of sense, doesn't it? That the more bees you have, because the queen is laying more eggs, and you get more bees, they're going to gather more food. Well, of course, on the other side of the coin, you can say, well, if you have more bees, you have to feed them. And they have to feed themselves. So big colonies tend to be um, hungry. And we tend to optimize egg laying rate at around 1,500 eggs per day at this time of year in the northern hemisphere where we have a lot of food coming in. And uh, we have, uh, as long as the weather cooperates, I'm dealing with uh, periodic uh, monsoon rains here today. Uh, but we're, we're having, uh, we see the relationship between the number of eggs the queen lays and the amount of brood and bees that a colony produces and the amount of food they're able to forage and, and get together. Well, obviously, we want to have brood patterns that look at least as good as this or better. This is a pretty remarkable brood pattern, in my opinion. But you see those spotty, uh, those, those missed brood cells, and there's all kinds of explanations for that. That's perfectly normal, but it's less than probably 5 or 10% of the total number of cells, especially in the spring. Now, the numbers go up a little bit in the fall, in the, in the summer and the fall, as the bees become a little more um, focused on every bee making her contribution to the hive. So when we talk about increasing our egg laying rate, we can do a variety of things as beekeepers that are going to help the bees. And obviously, one is feeding. We're not going to spend a whole a lot of time talking about feeding. We can do that some other time. But feeding both a nectar or the equivalent of nectar, which would be sugar syrup. And I do believe in sucrose syrup. I don't like to feed honey unless I'm, um, I have a lot that I want to get rid of for some reason. 
Um, I like to feed uh, sucrose. And I like to uh, provide some protein for these bees. If I don't have a lot of natural pollen coming in, which in our case we do here in Michigan, where I'm speaking from. Uh, so we want that, that mixture of the sucrose, which is basically what's in the flowers, not what's in the beehive, because the bees, of course, convert that sucrose into the simple sugars that you find in honey. So we want to duplicate what the bees are collecting, and we want to put in some protein if we can, and there are all sorts of ways to do that, but right now here on the 22nd of May in Michigan, we don't need to supplement with protein as long as we don't get a prolonged period of uh, confinement because of the weather. If you want to increase your egg laying rate, you have to do something about uh, varroa mites. They are going to interfere with the ability of the colony to support a queen to produce the number of eggs and therefore the number of bees that she can potentially produce. Finally, of course, with the mites, you want to avoid chemicals. So we want to have control, but we don't want to use any chemicals. Wow, that's a real challenge. So I don't have a good simple answer for that. If I did, I'd be a really rich person right now, and I'm going to assure you that I am not. So it's, it's one of those things we look at. Well, back a couple of weeks ago when we had snow on the ground here in Michigan, um, we were concerned about putting on protein batters, patties. And you can make these yourself. You can buy them from your bee supply company, right, Shane? And you can put them on those hives that overwintered. And you just tickle to death that they overwintered. You get that protein on there and build those colonies up so they really do a good job. Now, when I was in Hawaii a couple of years ago, it reminded me of the, the powdered uh, the soybean flour mix we used to put out in barrels and so forth, just like this, and let the bees gather their own protein. I don't know how much good this does. It seems like this is very wasteful. But the bees like it, and it probably does have a stimulative effect. And really what you're after in the spring, the late winter and spring in most areas in North America, is that stimulation that you get that, that little peak of, or push in terms of brood ring. Well, one of the other things that I'm concerned about, and we talk about bee biology, is longevity of bees. And that's the number of days, of course, of bees alive. If you were to look at the textbooks, and I happen to sell a few, I realize that. Uh, if you look at some of the books, they say that a worker bee lives six weeks after she uh, comes out of the cell. So a nine-week life cycle, three in the, in, the, in the cell, three in the house, and three in the field. Well, I don't think we have that anymore. I think we have much shorter bee lives, again, back to varroa mites, that our bees only live a month, maybe three weeks after they come out of the cells. So this really re influences our colony's ability uh, to gather food and raise new brood. And this happens, you know, we have to be focused on this both in the winter and the summer and all year round because our longevity, our bee longevity, is probably one of the things that we saw here in most of the northern parts of the country this year because our bees did not last as long as the winter did. So our colonies dwindled as bees were dying and it wasn't CCD, it was just these, these poor bees were just worn out. They would run out of food, they would run out of energy and they were dying and we still had snow coming. Uh, as late as just uh, three, four weeks ago. So this really interferes with our ability, our colony's ability anyway, to, to be productive. We don't have a real good handle on longevity in terms of genetics. I don't know of anybody that's done too much with this. I remember speaking to Joe Latshaw a couple of years ago about what he calls the grand old ladies. These are breeder queens that have lasted a long time. But just because a queen has lasted into her third year doesn't mean that she's producing worker bees that will live, you know, 10% longer or 20% longer, which is what we really ought to have. So when we look at our worker bees and all the things that are going on, well, there's a drone there, we want to worry about longevity in terms of their ability to do all the things that we expect them to do 
as well as um, being viable. And when we say being viable, being able to go out and perform the duties that the colony needs. And in the drone's case, that is to be able to go out there and mate with the queen and carry with him some viable sperm. So that's another issue we need to talk about as well. Well, we want to make sure that our bees are well fed. And whether or not we are using natural food supplies, as I prefer to do, or we supplement with artificial diets or we, we add sugar syrup uh, in areas that have natural pollen coming in in the, in the late winter and spring. But certainly we want to do everything we can to, to reduce stress. Stress on the bees. Now that's whether it's an, a beekeeper induced stress by too frequent visiting uh, the colonies and opening up the hives. And, you know, I think new beekeepers have the right to look at their bees. Uh, I don't worry about that too much. So if you got a new package of bees, I'd rather you check them than not and, and make sure there's not a problem. But we want our bees, our worker bees, to be well fed. And um, it's interesting, both with drones and workers, we need to have feeding in the larval stage when, they're, when they, of course, are being fed very actively. And as young adults, because if they don't get a lot of protein as young adults, both the drones, the queens, or all, the, all of the, the bees, they have to, and especially the drones, have to have a lot of good nutrition during this early developmental period of, say, the first week of their adult life. And if they don't get it, they don't live as long. And the drones are affected by uh, having low sperm migration. So they're not as effective. The queens probably don't do as, as good a job in, in lasting inside our hives. So when we look at this, here's a colony in Texas, uh, probably slightly Africanized, that's inside a birdhouse. And you look at these bees and you say, my goodness, look how, look how good they are. You know, this, this is a colony that's got a lot of bees. They're they kind of coming out of, out of the nest. And so you see a lot of bees. And when you don't see a lot of bees, I, in a colony, I become concerned about how well they're doing. Well, we have to have some sort of pest management. And I know beekeeper classes and so forth, we talk till we're blue in the face about managing varroa mites and small high beetles and tracheal mites and wax moths and you name it. Well, here's a picture of small high beetles in Hawaii. Well, you get a colony like that with that many beetles in it, it's dead. It doesn't know it yet necessarily, but it's really bad. Here's here's a slide I took uh, after a WAS meeting a year and a half ago. And we had worked the colony at, say, 11 o'clock in the morning. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we opened up that same colony. And we had, pardon the expression, changed the oil on this colony. So they had fresh oil with no, no uh, varroa mite, uh, uh, tracheal mite. Yeah, got to be right yet. Yeah. Small high beetles in there. Look at all these young beetles. These are newly emerged small high beetles that have gone into the colony and fallen into the oil so we can trap them, which was the whole point of these oil traps. So um, sidebar, here, sidebar here, if you want, do have a lot of beetles, you need to put in an oil trap. And I like the whole bottom oil traps. So I don't endorse anybody else's model. Sorry, I, I'm probably pissing off some people here, but you got to tell them the way you see them, right? This whole bottom trap works really well. But when you have, uh, if I can go back up, this many larvae in a, in a colony, it's, it's gone. So you want to keep the beetle population down. And if you're just trapping adult beetles, then they're not going to be laying eggs. And that's the, that's the key for small high beetles, no matter where you are in, in terms of what's going on and, and how you're trying to manage these, these little rascals. Well, for in terms of reducing varroa mites, we use all kinds of things. This is my friend Joe, uh, who is using powdered sugar on his colony, trying to reduce the varroa mite numbers. There are a number of techniques that have a low impact on the colonies, and they're, we're not exposing these bees to a lot of hard chemicals. And I wish I knew which, which ones of the other chemicals have a low impact on their bees. I don't think there's any research on, on uh, which ones are lower impact and which ones are worse. So that's a concern. Uh, moving on, uh, 
we of course we want to have successful queen replacement and I I point this out because this is the area that I personally have failed as a beekeeper in the last year or so. I have a lot of colonies that have not replaced their queens very successfully. Uh, last year many of us had a lot of swarming and we ended up the season with uh, weaker colonies than perhaps we should have had and then whether it was swarming or supersedure, they just did not get mated. And when a, when a queen doesn't get mated, you've lost that colony. It's just devastating. So we want to minimize that swarming instinct as much as we can. And how do we do that? Well, you know, there are books written on this and a new one coming out that will be written about this in terms of giving more room and providing, um, you know, young queens and all this stuff. But Boy, when the bees want to swarm, it's really hard to fight that. Also, when we're talking about supersedure, and I think we, we're seeing, since we're all mites have come in in North America, we're seeing, a, whoops, sorry about that, folks. We're seeing more and more early supersedure when it comes to uh, the, uh, the queens. And whether a queen used to last two years, I don't know. But I think now we're seeing supersedure once or twice a season in some of our operations. Maybe they're the ones that aren't so successful. I don't know. But when we do have supersedure in a colony, we want to make sure that we have a good, uh, healthy queen that's well mated. And that's the key. When we look at this newly mated queen and she's a, surrounded by all these worker bees and her re little queen retinue, it's nice to see this. And it's important we see this because we if we see a, a small runty type queen running around the hive with no worker bees being attracted to her. You have to say to yourself, well, look, this, she's just not as attractive as she should be. We want to have these nice queens. Part of that is the number of drones she mates to. Um, and we know from some of Dave Tarpey's work there in North Carolina that the more drones a queen mates to, the more attractive she is to her 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 own daughters, if you will, her house, her sisters too. So, and that's related to how much sperm she's carrying in her body, the stored sperm in her spermatheca. So we we want to make sure the drones have higher sperm counts, and that goes back to the, the nutrition thing we talked about earlier. The other thing is this longevity of the queen. Well, we talked about that just a minute ago, and we want to have queens that last a long time, but we also want to make sure that they last long enough that they have enough sperm that will last as long as they do. And, you know, I don't think we do that every day in terms of what's what's uh, routinely seen out there in the bee world. Oh, I'm sorry, we got we got a rogue uh, clicker here. I'm going to stop there. Okay, good. Now, here's a West Virginia queen rearing operation. One of the state bee inspectors down there has this little setup and apparently let his kids go, go rogue on him in terms of painting for orientation, which is probably a good idea. And these small nukes are one way of uh, producing a lot of queens in the spring. More and more evidence because of small high beetles and because of queen quality, we want to have a larger nuke with more bees producing a queen. Well, of course, that makes them more expensive and makes it a challenge in terms of what we're all trying to do, and that's make a living or have a, a fun time with our, our bees in terms of the uh, um, well, the fun and games, I guess, the fun of, of beekeeping. Well, we're going to get to talk now about a little bit about food collection and storage. We, of course, want to have a situation where we have abundant nectar. When I say that, we also have to have our bees in a position where they can go gather that nectar. And that's going to be primarily sucrose, and we're going to convert, convert that into glucose and fructose. We also have to have high protein pollen. I just wrote an article for ABJ about um, pine pollen. Pine pollen is not always attractive to bees, but one of the disadvantages with things like pine is that they have a high fiber content and maybe four or four, four or five times more fiber than you'd expect in clover or other prime uh, pollen sources. So I think that we, we uh, we seem to think that if we have a lot of pollen coming in, we're in good shape, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. But what do you do as a beekeeper? Short of moving, there's not, not a whole lot you can do. 
you're, you're responding to the weather as best you can and maybe you can reduce the number of colonies you have in the location which may or may not help but you need to have that high protein pollen coming into your colonies as long as you in the season as you can possibly have it well of course the beekeeper can do one thing and that is provide room for bees to provide to store that food both the protein in the pollen and all course during the nectar and, and honey flow um, my friend Tom Ryder did this work a number of years ago when he was at Ohio State as a student. Followed up on this when he was a US, or as a USDA researcher. And he showed that the more drawn empty comb you put on a colony, the more honey they'll produce, up to 30% more, when they're given a lot more space to put that nectar into. And uh, so if you put your supers on in April, uh, here in Michigan or earlier, in the uh, southern areas, uh, you'd expect that they would have more space. Now, foundation doesn't have the same effect, and every new beekeeper says, well, how do I give them drawn comb when I don't have any? And the answer is, well, you have to have a plan to get the bees to draw that comb out the previous season, and then give it to them the next year as, as, as best you can. Uh, but the drawn empty combs are an attractive magnet for these bees to um, put their nectar in there as they're ripening it to draw or, or pass the, uh, the warmed air inside the hive over it so that the, uh, you get this dehydration of the nectar into, as it converts into, into honey. If you don't put the uh, supers on, and I remember being at a bee meeting once and a beekeeper came up to me and it was the middle of July. The beekeeper says, do you think it's time for me to put my supers on? And, you know, you, you want to scream or shake them or do something violent, and you'd have to be very polite and explain to them that, well, actually, you probably would be better off if you put the supers back on in April or May because those bees now have been without any place to store the food that's been abundant in your area, and they've lost that opportunity. So that's one of the things a beekeeper can do. Um, there's there's some crops, of course, the bees, uh, some plants that bees visit. The nectar source is very attractive. Uh, cucumbers are one of them. Many of the vine crops produce some very attractive uh, amounts of nectar, but not very many flowers per acre. And so what happens to the bees? They go downhill when they're put into the pollination in these areas. So if you're doing any pollination work this, this year, if your bees are on cucumbers or melons or squash or pumpkins or any of what I call the summer crops, you really have to monitor them for both nectar and protein because a cucumber flower is not going to support a beehive. What you do need to do is to make sure that the bees are in there collecting and processing the honey, building new comb, and doing what we expect bees to do, and that's to, make, to produce honey. Well. Um, I've talked about this before, and this is the whole concept of homeostasis, and uh, that's just a fancy word to say that everything's in balance inside the beehive, and we know that uh, bees that have a single father through instrumental insemination, we do a single drone insemination, that those colonies don't have the ability to maintain themselves as well as naturally mated colonies with multiple fathers. So this is probably a, a function of adding a lot of different genes represented by these different uh, drones that the queen mates with and increasing our diversity and, and, and this all helps for survival. So this whole concept of homeostasis, I'm probably going to pound away at that for the next few years in terms of why we need to have diversity in our, in our gene pool. Well, here's some bees. Uh, we've been working, you can see there are a lot of drones there. And if you look, I don't know if this pointer is, is able to go on. Oh, let's find the pointer. Where'd it go? Hello, pointer. There you are. Um, um, sometimes these things just don't work. And so when we look at the, you know, when I don't want it, I've got it. But if you look at the drones that are here, you've got, you can see there's some that are fairly dark and a few that are fairly light in color. 
So this is a, a good indication you've got a queen that's mated with different drones of unrelated sorts. And, uh, and I think that's a really good thing to have. So we want to have a lot of drones and we want to have that. Homeostasis, of course, is a key part in wintering bees, whether you're in Florida and your winter is two days long, <laughs> or if you're up here where it seems to be forever, and uh, any, anywhere in between. So you want to have, uh, these are bees of Mike Palmer's up in northern Vermont, and he's got them wrapped, he's got them um, well cared for. It was about what? Warmed up to at least 10 degrees that day. And it's still in December. So you want to have colonies that come up through the spring, and my two and a half bee colony concept here's the two full-size colonies and two nukes that uh, you're wintering nukes and you're able to do some of the things that we need to do in terms of keeping well-fed uh, bees. Well, in summary then, bee biology really requires healthy bees. They've got to be disease and mite free. If we look at the work that Ernesto Guzman has done in Ontario, he suggests that almost 90% of the bees that die every winter are directly or indirectly affected by varroa mites. So obviously a, a good, healthy, or vigorous varroa control program, starting with sampling and uh, counting the number of mites we, we have in our hives is a key part. We also need to have well-fed queens. They need to be productive and mated to a large number of uh, viable drones. Seems pretty simple. This is pretty basic biology. But to, I think these are all keys in having colonies that are, are filled up with bees. And if you look at these worker bees on this nice brood comb, you see the darker bees, the yellower bees, and some in between. And you say, well, we've got some diversity here, so this is a good thing. And we want to encourage that as much as we can. Well, the commercial comes in now. We've got a Bee Essentials, my field guide with uh, Rob Muir and uh, this is a beginner's book, and ta-da, the new edition of uh, Honeybee Biology and Beekeeping will be out here in about a month. And uh, this is with uh, this is a Dewey Karen's book, and I've gone on as a, a significant contributor. How about that for a phrase? So we've got this will be in full color, and this isn't even on the website yet. So keep keep posted for that. So that's it, bee biology, and I've done it in half an hour. How about that, Shane? That's uh, quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, so I wanted to do something. We have because this is the last in our series that people have a chance to do a little uh, Q and A um, and you know have a chance to talk about some of these things. Because I know you like to heat these things at an hour. Yes, I, I do try. Um, first, it seems appropriate um, to since you just flashed up those books. Um, and, and we will certainly indulge those commercials, um, that uh, someone here says that they really enjoy your increase essentials, which is not uh, one which you displayed, but uh, there we go. I'll plug that one for you. Well, thank you, because I really get a lot of positive feedback, and I just was at a meeting last weekend, and somebody said they'd read it six times. And I'm thinking, I haven't read anything in my life six times. <laughs> I've written six times. Well, you do it routinely when you write. Um, and at first I thought, well, maybe I've made a big mistake here. I'm not a very good writer. But people all argue that, well, it's because there's more material there to dig out. And that was certainly one of the things that Rob and I talked about when we uh, came up with the uh, Bee Essentials, the field guide. We wanted something that would get a new beekeeper started but would stick with them for a couple of years. And... Uh, you know, I have some good good comments back from well-established beekeepers, and I'm delighted that both of these books are now being used as textbooks for bee schools. So there's the, the rest of the, the uh, not-so-hidden uh, 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 promotion. But Dewey's book, um, you know, when I first saw Honeybee Biology and Beekeeping for Dewey Karen, it was uh, a few years ago. And it was a 50-page mimeograph, which may date all of us that are talking about this. And now it's, uh, what are we at, 368 pages and hundreds and hundreds of color photographs and a lot of good biology, a lot of good beekeeping in there. And one of the things that Dewey insisted on doing is that each chapter would stand on its own in terms of uh, 
content. Well, we, more we, advertising. We, we look forward to seeing it. We do have some questions rolling in. I bet. Uh, and uh, there's some, some trends here, some similarities in the questions. We'll take one uh, first uh, regarding powdered sugar. Sort of what, what's, what's your opinion on powdered sugar? What's the opinion nationwide in terms of varroa control? And if one were to actually uh, try and use powdered sugar as a means of, of treatment, how often, how much, etc. would you have to do? Well, this is where I need to have a truck board that I can go to, Shane. We have to work on that option. Okay. In this sort of, um, I was just in um, Indiana last weekend and in Ohio the weekend before, and at both times people came up and confessed that they no longer treat their bees with anything except powdered sugar, which to me is a, a sign that there are a lot of people out there having pretty good success with uh, what they're doing with the, the product. And when I say they treat, there, there are two ways to use powdered sugar. And we're talking about screen bottom boards, which of course I know you folks sell. And you spray the, the tray with the uh, powdered sugar, uh, so with the with Pam, or coat it with some kind of cooking oil. Mm -hmm. And then put that in the screen bottom board. And then I use a full cup of powdered sugar. And I put it over a piece of uh, window screen and then uh, kind of brush it around the top of the, the brood nest. So if it's two or three deeps or two or three mediums, I brush it down. And then I use a, a bee brush and brush it down there. So you can use it two ways. First of all, you can use it as a sampling tool. And that's what we've been doing the last couple of years. And, and uh, we just want to know what our mite levels are, our varroa mite levels, because however it works, it's either a combination of the the mites let go of the uh, uh, bee because they've got powdered sugar on their tarsi, or the bees are getting too hot and the bees are, you know, and that drives the mites off. It doesn't make any difference. The mites leave the bees when they when you powder sugar them. And we're just trying to do the bees in the brood nest because that's where most of the mites are going to be. And we want the mites to fall down through that screen and onto that sticky board and stay there. So we can go back in 24 or 48 hours, count the number of mites, and that will give us an indication of our mite load. Now, we don't get 100% of the mites because, remember, most of the mites are probably in the brood nest. So the mites work catching are a certain percentage of the, the feeding mites, so the, what the scientists call the phoretic mites that are on the adult bees. So that's a sampling technique. So you could do a sample like that every week or every month. And I personally want to do it once a month and uh, see what our mite trends in. Because we know that the numbers are going to go up uh, following normal mite biology. Uh, as uh, mid to late summer comes around, we expect to see more, more varroa mites. But at any point, you can go to a treatment option. And all you do then is simply increase the frequency of doing this. Now, I talked about stressing bees, and I know that powdered sugar has to be stressful. So I tell people not more than twice a week, but ideally twice a week. You use this powdered sugar treatment and let the mites fall through. You, you take the mites out of the hive and uh, scrape them off and, you know, put them in the garden, the gar you know, garbage, wherever. And so you're reducing your mite load on your phoretic bees. And I do this for... A, two to three weeks, and what this is going to do is remove a lot of the, the mites. doesn't remove them all, but we're not using any, any other chemical. Now, I think that if you use screen bottom boards and a mite sampling or uh, control system like this, you also have to combine this with the addition of getting some stock in your hives that have some mite resistance. And so I think the two of them together, or, or multiple methods of resistance, will be really useful in terms of um, getting a handle on mite numbers. And so, I know some beekeepers are doing that, and they're having good luck with it. Uh, they're probably a lot more diligent about it than I am. Um, I still suffer this problem of uh, being away from my bees when I want to do something with them. And then I get home, it's either snowing or raining or 
there's a family event. So your beekeeping can be pretty frustrating sometimes if you let things get to you. So don't let them get to you. What else you got there, Shane? Um, well, I want to I want to continue with this powdered sugar just for a second. Um, are you are you aware of any uh, studies that have been done that looks at the efficacy of powdered sugar as a, as a treatment? And I sort of heard there in your response that that you really like the idea of powdered sugar. And correct me if I'm misinterpreting what you said. The idea of powdered sugar and and varroa resistant uh, queens well, I, I as sure sort of a, a an ideal package. Would you yeah. would you say that's the best treatment? For I, think, I think it's the uh, it's the least uh, in, amount of impact on what the bees are doing. You know, my own problems with any chemical, and I don't care what it is. And okay, yes, you can argue that sugar is a chemical, uh, but when you expose anything to a beehive, whether it's a, a high-end molecule or a organic compound or whatever you want to call it, that you are not really developing resistance because you have an artificial system involved in terms of controlling the mites. So we would like to have tolerant or resistant bees that will do that. But the only way you're going to get that is to go chemical free. And so I think the powdered sugar is the next best thing that we can do. Now you ask about data. Actually there are some nice research studies out there that show that if you treat your colony once a month with powdered sugar, it does not affect the mite load on your colony. And I agree with that. That's why I say you want to do it twice a week for two or three, maybe four weeks, uh, so that they have this repetitive treatment. And the reason I say that is, remember, most of your mites are going to be in the, in the brood cells. So if you want to control the mites, you've got to get, you have to hit them with the powdered sugar as they come out of the cells. Both the mother mite, the founder's mite, and the daughters come out, and you hit them with powdered sugar. So twice a week for three or four weeks is a pretty intensive undertaking, especially if you have to move some supers out of the way. But um, I think it's a, it's a viable option. Or do it after your nectar flow is over, depending on where you are in this country and, and um, or wherever you are. I, I guess we have people all over the world now listening to these things, right, Shane? Yes, we so do. So it, it gets to be a challenge to give one set of recommendations. Uh, I like powdered sugar because it's easy and it's relatively cheap, uh, and which uh, some people say that's the way I am, easy and cheap, but we won't go there. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Come on, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm distracted by, by previewing uh, your next question. Um, so uh, uh, forgive me. There's, should I be, should there, I be concerned? No, you should not. You should not. I'm just trying to screen these as uh, as you're responding. Um, there's a there's a lot of questions coming in about sort of the nutrition and feeding and um, and how best to do that. Everything from, you know, what do you think about sort of honey bee healthy um, or other supplements along those lines to uh, nutrition sort of across the nation. And this one I think is is kind of interesting too sort of looking at pre-varroa and our need to feed pre-varroa uh, versus now our need, you know, everyone harps on nutrition and feeding in, in a post-varroa world. What, what, I was not in the industry pre-varroa. How, how does it differ pre versus post-varroa in terms of our... Well, Shane, I happen oh. to be old enough to have well, been around before. I know, I know. That's why I'm asking, because I when thought, I was, who better to answer this question? Student, when I was a graduate graduate student with E.C. Martin, Bert Martin at Michigan State, you know, one of the things he did is he collected fresh pollen every summer, and he put it in the freezer in the lab, and he'd get it out um, in uh, late winter, and we'd make fresh pollen and uh, sugar uh, patties, put them between two uh, sheets of wax paper, and put them on the hives to boost them. That was just a routine management technique back in the 1960s. So I don't think there's any reason why we should reject that or think it's anything unusual or uh, unnatural, which I've been accused of doing unnatural beekeeping by feeding bees. Um, you know, you can take two, you know, at least two points of view. If you don't feed bees, they're dead. Is that natural? Yes, it is. 
But is that what you want as a beekeeper? Not in my opinion. You want to keep your bees alive. So natural pollen with sugar, and we're talking about uh, at that time we were using beet sugar here in Michigan, uh, mixing it in a, 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 making a patty out of it works really well. Has a strong stimulative effect on building up brood in late winter. In Michigan, we're talking about in February and early March before the natural pollen start coming in. Now, should we be feeding now in Michigan because it's raining today? Probably not. But on the other hand, if you get a stretch anywhere of really, really confining weather, and I was in Virginia not too long ago this month, and uh, they'd had 10 days of rain, and they were dealing with a, a definite shortage of natural pollen, and the bees had stopped supporting brood production. They had sealed brood, but no open brood, no eggs, and no larvae. And the only way I know of to get around that is to feed, and even though it was May in Virginia. Um, that's the only way you're going to do it. And why is that important? Because the bees that you produce during that time period are going to go on and make that honey crop. And uh, that's, that's that whole bit about egg laying rate. If the, if the queen's not laying eggs, you're not going to have bees for the honey crop, honey flow. Did I answer all those questions? Um, yes, and I'll, uh, well, not, not quite, but I'll get to the ones you didn't. But I, I'll elaborate on that point just a little bit. We had uh, a period of about two, two weeks of cool, damp weather where we actually had, uh, this was probably about a month ago, where we had colonies uh, starve um, because they simply couldn't get out and get to the, the, the nectar that was there, the pollen that was out there, but they just weren't able to fly for it. Um, and, and I was talking with some people about that and the consequences of that. And I think not only are you compromising the colony numbers in terms of their ability to produce honey later on, but but also the the malnourished bees that are in that colony that you're asking then to produce brood food for the larvae that are present or that they are trying to raise is is compromised. So it's it's it it has a trickle down effect in terms of future generations that I think people don't don't realize that the implications that it's not just the bees in the hive now, but it's future generations that are, are paying the price as well. Would you agree with that? I would, I would agree, and I know that last year a lot of us had a, um, not everybody, but a lot of people had a poor August and September, and so the colonies went into winter with bees that were not well fed, and, now, and then we had a really long winter. So when you have a short winter, you might get away with it, but when you have this prolonged uh, confinement, you know, which, you know, just wouldn't seem to go on forever, that the colony suffers because you don't have enough winter bees, or what some people refer to as what should be fat bees, filled with all these nutritional uh, components. Um, they're not able to support the brood brain that the colony needs in the spring. Now, some stocks, like the carniolans, are not notorious for holding back and holding back and holding back before they start laying uh, eggs in large numbers. Uh, they, they keep a small number there, but they don't explode the way others because they're waiting for the natural food supply to start up. But then when you get a break in that natural foods, food supply, as you described, Shane, they, then they, they shut off. And now you're not going to have the building up, build up of bees, and you're not going to have the population of bees you need for honey production. So it, it, it is a real challenge to know, know what should I be doing today and if our crystal balls work better, we can forecast the weather. Um, we'd all be better beekeepers, but I still don't have a, a an app for that. <laughs> I think you should. That should be your next project. Um, <laughs> there's so you 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 mentioned carniolans, and that brings up the the topic of of genetics. I think. Um, you know, much of what you talked about tonight was genetic diversity and, and how the, that, that affects a colony. Uh, the more diverse, of course, the, the more advantageous. So what can, what can a, a backyard uh, beekeeper do to, one, sort of help ensure that they've got good genetic diversity? And then also, I guess, what, what 
races of bees um, do you think might be more advantageous? Because, you know, packages, they're Italians for the most part, um, or, or based on sort of that, that, that Italian strain. Uh, because they build up, they produce a lot of bees quickly, uh, and that's what you want in a package, and certainly the package producers want that so they can produce those packages. But they may not, in the long haul, you know, that's good to, those Italians are good to get the package up and running, but in the long haul might not be the best choice. So, well, I, what certainly, would you say I, I certainly agree with your assessment on the Italians because I know that most European countries have gone to County Owens uh, almost to a, a, a level of, of obsession that everybody keep our County Owens stock. And part of that is that they are a little more sensitive to the environment and they do stop egg laying when there's a, uh, uh, a dearth and they don't just keep eating all the food they've stored. This is, this is a real concern that I have. Um, we have purchased packages, we've purchased nukes from Carniolan suppliers, some from California, for, specifically to get away from that southern Italian bias. And um, I think it's about time that some of the folks that are producing these bees try something else to see if maybe this won't work better in, in, in our marketplace because we, we do have some real concerns. We also, and of course, Shane, you know this well, but we have to go to mite tolerant stock. We have to go to resistant stock, stuff that does not die if they see a veromite. And um, I just got hold of some video clips from somebody who's been playing with this in Indiana or Ohio. And there's a picture where this guy takes and puts a, a varroa mite down on the top of the top bar of a frame. You see this worker bee run over it and just bite it. And man, I want that bee. I want that bee to bite my mite. You know, I don't want those <laughs> things around. <laughs> and, you know, normally, you know, what well, would expect the, the, to see the bees get the mites on them. They do this little shake and rattle and roll. Say, get this off me, get this off me. But to see the, the worker bees coming right up to the mites and attack them, ah, man, that's great stuff. So, you know, when, when you get into the whole concept of how do you defend yourself uh, as a beekeeper, well, having bees of a genetic makeup, and I'm not saying, saying Carniolans have this exclusively, but we need to have this, you know, hygienic behavior. We need to have the, the, the grooming behavior, which this biting is all about. And anything else we can find that's in our mites. And it will, we will be better off as a beekeeping industry here in North America if we do that. And um, until people agree that this is the approach we're going to have to take, we're going to have problems with varroa mites. Because as long as you're in an area where somebody's treating it with chemicals, you will have varroa mites. No way around it. Sounds just, just depressing. Well, it's it's truthful. I think um, I, I'm curious to know what's the the obstacle that's preventing us from moving in that direction. Is it the is it the large queen producers? I I don't know about the queen producers, but I know that um, when when you have more than a few hives of bees, some of these things become really expensive to implement, like mm -hmm. maintaining resistant stocks. Um, so there's a cost aspect, and there's also a, a convenience aspect as well as far as um, what's it cost to put on a treatment, whatever you name the treatment. And uh, I, I love the fact that Randy Oliver said that somebody, somebody reported back that he said, I can powder trigger a hive in eight seconds. Well, that assumed that somebody opened the hive and smoked it and then got every of the supers out of the way, and then somebody else came along and closed the super up. But yeah, powdered sugar is a fairly fast technique. It'll take you longer to count the mites than it is to put the powdered sugar on, for most beekeepers that I know. Uh, the other thing is we don't have good numbers to say that on July 5th, if we've got 14 mites and a mite drop in a full-size uh, county and colony, do we have to do something else? And mm -hmm. we don't have as much data as we should for everybody out there. We have some benchmarks now, but after 25, 26 years, 
we certainly don't have all the answers. Um, but as long as people are out there trading, and that is an economic solution, is to go out there and find something that's cost effective. And, and I know that uh, every bee supply company is selling materials that control mites at various levels. But until the industry says we really want to have in, in, and we want to have resistance, um, we're not going to be successful. Now, the one thing that I'd love to see, I'd love to see areas in the world or the country where if you're in, we'll pick any of you, Podunk County somewhere, this is a, a no treatment county and nobody uses anything other than say powdered sugar or perhaps one of the organic acids and say we're going to restrict it to just that in the attempt to try to build up our resistance and um, Many people know that I've gone on about this at great length about bee clubs. This is one of the places where the bee club can do a lot of good and, you know, probably annoy some other members because they are the people that want to uh, use the chemicals. And uh, but we're going to have to do something sign significant for a long-term answer here. Um, without the chemicals, we can probably, uh, well, we know from other places that you can get resistance in as little as four years. With chemicals, it's going to take more like 400. So I really think it's to our benefit to bite the bullet and uh, you know become really concerned about my resistance. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's jump back to uh, to to feeding just a little bit. Um, there's a couple questions here going back to that that uh, um, you mentioned. One, you don't like to feed. Uh, honey, you feed uh, sucrose, and... Um, uh, let, me, let me explain. I do feed honey, and you know how I feed it? I feed it as frames of honey added to a nuke or a colony that needs to be fed. Okay. And I think that's an elegant way of getting food to the bees where they can use it. And <laughs> to you, I need to be out there doing that right now, except it was raining when I wanted to do it. So... Um, by adding frames of honey, yes, we can do we can supplement the bees and um, the uh, bee essentials, the field guide. We talk about the fact that you should be a little reluctant to get rid of all that honey by selling it. Keep some of it around for the bees. The other technique I use for feeding honey is to take um, a box of honey, especially if it's got some granulation, and put it underneath a colony that you want to feed. So the brood nest is above that honey box, and let the bees go down there and liquefy that honey and take it up. And I, you know, a lot of beekeepers end up with a, a box or two of granulated honey, and they don't know what to do. And they say, "Oh, should I, should I throw it out? Should I burn it? Should I put it in the garbage?" So I say, "No, feed it to the bees, mm -hmm. as long as you know it's your honey and it has to come from somebody else." But what I don't do, and I, that was my comment about feeding with honey, is I don't make honey syrup and mix it up and put it in containers. I just tend not to like to do that. And I know that the, the science shows that there's more benefit in feeding sucrose in water than honey in water as a stimulative feed and a beneficial feed for the, for the colonies. Interesting. So, so there's research out there that shows that sucrose is... is for the more advantageous, yeah, it's, it's, it's more advantageous to feed sucrose than it is to feed honey. Yeah, that's been shown many years ago. Yeah, huh. both in Canada and uh, Europe and uh, the United States. So it's across the board. Of course, nowadays people say, "Well, you can't feed beet sugar because they're GMO." And you know, I don't have an answer for that. I I just don't know enough about GMOs to to form an opinion. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we we talked a lot about uh, powdered sugar um, is a, as a treatment mechanism. Um, what are your thoughts on? And you alluded to organic acids. So, what are your thoughts on on formic acid, oxalic acid, which of course is is not officially approved in the United States, and and some of the um, like the thymol, the essential oils and such. Let me just say I'm awfully glad somebody else is doing this work because I don't like doing it, and I don't have any experience with anything other than powdered sugar. So that is your treatment? Well, that's my cop-out. 
by not using anything else. I can't comment on anything else. Okay. And I'm not horrible. Uh, I just I just don't want to deal with them. Um, that's you know, it's, it's interesting when I you know I've been in see Pennsylvania, Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, Ohio in the last uh, three weeks, and there are more and more people that don't treat. Um, at least they're at a very minimum treatment level, and it's it's encouraging to me to see that they're getting away with it. Um, on the other hand, I don't know what their mortalities are during the winter. Um, what do you? How do you feel about? We talked about protein uh, supplements. Um, yes. Do you trap pollen yourself and make up your own, or do you just buy the I patties? I have trapped pollen for quite a few years, okay. and um, I. Uh, it's because that there's a too great a of a. Uh, chance that I might inoculate a colony with chalk root with that trap pollen because that's a wonderful way to take out a colony is to feed pollen that has some chalk root mummies even if they're chewed up by the bees so I tend to stay away from pollen in terms of feeding now if you can I know some of the manufacturers they make a uh, uh, irradiated um, pollen mix and that would be okay for me but I have not used it uh, I've been using uh, pretty much the the standard diets that, uh, that are available from the bee supply companies and because as long as the bees are taking it down and remember most of these things are primarily sugar anyway and that protein is just adding to the, the uh, nutrition and I think we're using it for a short enough period during the late winter and spring that uh, we're not at risk of uh, doing any long-term harm to the, the uh, reproductive cycle of the worker bees. Uh, we have enough other stuff going on that probably does that for us. So if, if someone were to, to trap pollen, then what would you recommend a, a front-mounted trap so that you don't get the mummies falling down in or a top yeah, mount? That would be great if you, could, if you could avoid the mummies and then I think more important than anything else is the, the day you collect the pollen, you freeze it mm. and keep it frozen until you use it. Okay. Um, beetle traps. You mentioned uh, you like the, uh, the the one that sort of slides underneath the hive. Um, what do you? Uh, what kind of oil do you put in that? And uh, do you have any experience with some of the others? Well. I haven't used these here in Michigan, but I certainly saw enough of them in Hawaii that this is this is an under the, the hive beetle trap. Both of these images, and um, that's simply uh, uh, cooking oil from Costco or some other supply company. And you, if you have this level of, of mite, excuse me, of uh, beetles, then you need to be removing the oil and changing it probably once or so a week, uh, just to keep the the numbers down. But it's a it's pretty effective, and the other thing that's effective in, in doing is uh, uh, it kills a lot of varroa mites. So if you have a high varroa level, this is going to be your in an, in lieu of powdered sugar. Mm -hmm. Of course, powdered sugar doesn't do anything about the beetles. They just crawl out of it and say, "What's this?" Um, so I think that uh, these uh, under under the hive traps. With this, there's of course a screen there that keeps the bees from getting access to the oil, which would not be a good thing. And then you can monitor your beetle numbers very nicely, especially where you are, Shane, in North Carolina and in the southern states. You can monitor your numbers uh, once your temperatures get up to 80, 90 degrees at night, uh, during the day, and probably not much cooler at night. So you can really monitor what's going on. But you know. Once again, I saw overwintering beetles here in Michigan who survived very nicely in the, inside the cluster, inside the beehive. And uh, the weak nukes that I got through this, this spring, they had beetle larvae when I fed protein. So March, Michigan, beetles. You just don't expect that. Mm. Um, that, uh, that brings us to the... Uh, a little bit beyond the seven o'clock hour, not much though. Um, so I do want to 
as you mentioned, I do try to hold this to the to the hour mark, especially when I've got other uh, guest speakers' times involved, such as yourself. I appreciate you, Larry, coming in and joining us again uh, this evening to discuss bee biology. I'm looking forward to this book. Um, we uh, will also have to talk about uh, future topics and maybe get you in here again. I want to thank you for the series that you've done covering a whole host of topics that everyone has certainly benefited from. I know I have. I, I learn something every something new every time. So I do appreciate it. I appreciate your time. I know you are, you're well traveled and in high demand. So I, I do once again thank you for, for sharing your time with us this evening and in previous sessions. So thank you very much, Larry. Well, I, I, I thank you too for the opportunity to visit with folks. And uh, I, I enjoy the people that come up and say, I heard you talk at the webinar, which is, you know, when you're, I'm sitting here at my office with talking to a computer screen, I say, who the heck is out there? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit daunting. So next year we need to uh, come up with some software or maybe a piece of equipment so I can start um, uh, doodling in front of people, so draw pictures of beehives and how to do some of the management stuff. Kind of like the electronic chalkboard. So if you have yeah. any suggestions, I'm uh, interested in doing some of that. Well, we can. Anyway, it would be nice to come back next year or whatever and uh, do what we can. And just a personal note, I've got, uh, since I spoke to everybody, I've got two uh, new grandsons up in Alaska. So. Well, congratulations. It's a, a big deal for me. So, um, Yeah, my daughter, uh, you know, she went full term with twins. So, Congratulations. So, the big news. So, hello to everybody, and hope you have a good season. And I know I'll see some of you in North Carolina. There's more of you at EIS, and it's going to be a good year. So, hang in there. Keep buzzing. Excellent. Well, thank you, Larry. Have a good evening, and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, James. Bye.